Public Utilities Regulatory Commission. Thank you very much for joining us today. Our Chairman, Dr. Spencer Thomas, CEO, Dr. George Matthew, other members of the PURC staff, our specially invited guests joining us here pres presently and also virtually. Welcome to the first in our series of consultations. As you may know, the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission is the independent, and I repeat that very word, independent regulator of the utility sector in Grenada. Our aim is to establish a sustainable, affordable, and reliable electricity sector for all stakeholders. Some of our functions include, we set and review the price of electricity, we provide an enabling environment for renewable energy investment. We hear and resolve disputes between utility companies and consumers, and we recommend the awarding of licenses and permits. Hearing all of these functions, I'm sure that you have an appreciation as to why the PURC, especially in today's climate, was necessary to be established and to function. Before we move forward, I would ask us all to prepare ourselves for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your abundance of mercy and grace. Thank you for getting us here physically and to be ever so present and mindful of your graciousness towards us. As we delve into this document, O oh Father, we ask for a release of knowledge and understanding straight from the heavens so that we can reach the solutions that will be beneficial for all stakeholders involved. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now I would ask for our, chairman, our CEO, Dr. George Matthew, chairman first, okay. Now I will ask our chairman, Dr. Spencer Thomas, who is joining us virtually, thanks to technology, to present some remarks. Thank you. Are you hearing me? Yes, you are, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sophia. And let me say good evening and welcome to this very important uh, session. Unfortunately, we have to obey the COVID protocols, and I have to be joining you virtually. And I think we will have, nonetheless, a very successful evening um, in terms of our objectives for this for this well, this early on uh, due to COVID that we had an interrupted schedule. Um, there was a series of consultations planned early on and we were in the thick of things when COVID hit and that, that has changed the landscape a bit for us. We we'll also recognize that in recent times there was some significant development in the sector uh, which again will impact on what that we are doing. But I would like to indicate very clearly that the role of the POC remains because the development objective... Once again, technology wins and it refuses to cooperate. <laughs> so my apologies for that, guys. We will first hear from our CEO, Dr. George Matthew.
Okay, once again, good afternoon to everyone and welcome to our first in a series of public consultations in 2021. Um, it's a process we started in 2019 by having um, written comments engaged from the key stakeholders and the public and then we've uh, transitioned that into 2020 having some public hearings like this. Um, COVID had put a pause on this and now we resume in, in terms of getting some of these um, documents finalized. Here I'm going to just speak to um, regulating Grenada's electricity sector and give you some overarching um, pointers on some of the key aspects that um, drives what we're doing at the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission. So as an initial background on into what is the PRC and where the PRC came from. Um, now there's an actual development process behind the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission. Um, a lot of this stems from the um, compliance of Grenada with the Paris Accord. Um, there's a lot of uh, multi-party and collaborative efforts into what we do. The national determined uh, contribution, um, the sustainability plan, the Nash Grenada National Sustainability Plan, this all play a very important or key role into the overarching perspective of the PRC and where we're heading. Um, the PRC has a vision of having an open door policy. Um, the consultation process here is very reflective of what, we, what we're hoping to do in terms of ensuring that all stakeholders and everyone have their say into what we're doing. Um, ongoing discussions would, have, would also be an, an imperative aspect of this also. So you may ask, what is some of these um, overarching aspects that I spoke to, the national determined contributions, um, we have the sustainability goals and all these other different aspects in, in, in what we do. The policy objectives of Grenada is what is key. Um, and in, within our policy objectives, we, we strive for sustainability, uh, affordability, and secure electricity. There, from this came some laws. So you have the overarching policy, and then you have the laws in place. So you have the Electricity Act of 2016, which was amended in 2017, and the PERC Act of 2016 also. And then we have regulations, and we are seeking to ensure that all the regulations are put into place. Now, the regulations and what we're doing, we, we, we seek to balance the national and consumer's interests, um, and that's in, on a global perspective. We're looking at ensuring that there's compliance. We ensure, and we ensure that there's the upholding of transparency in everything that happens and what has been done. Uh, basically, the regulations are your rules and directives for governing or for guiding the actual sector that has been regulated. Now, the PRC is caught in the middle of all of this. We need to balance the... the it's a balancing act between the rate payers and the investors, right? Um, we have capital investors, we have persons who are looking for a return on their investment, and then we also have the consumers. So everything that is being invested in here passes through to the consumers. So we are set with a very hard task of ensuring that what is being passed on is the, is, is the true cost of service that is really reflective of what the customers need to pay. But we also want to ensure that the investors themselves have a climate in which they can invest and be able to, to ensure that the service is sustainable and you can keep it. So you, have, you attract investors and you keep them um, bought in, basically. Now, regulations is also being considered as a proxy for public ownership or competition. Um, we have, we, we, we can see here that the regulations can promote sustainability based on the rules and directives that drives that orientation. And it can also give you some level of competition. And that competition here is not a market competition per se, but it's a guided set of competition. So in Grenada, we seeking to have competition for the market meaning that we're looking for the best price and the best orientation that can take us to, to what it is that we need to do, right? So in terms of investing in the sector, we want to have competition for the market. We don't have a very market structure in here in which you have competition within the market itself, but we have competition for the market, which is very critical to understand. Now, we are seeking and we want to ensure that the regulations secure our future, right? 
and a future that we envision, and that's from a policy orientation, and then we have the PRC as the, the, regulating, the regulating body, basically ensuring that we are in the long term not going to follow the pathway that leads to disorientation, but to follow a, a green future, right? A green economy in that sense. So basically, we want to be free from fuel poverty. Um, so in essence, we want security of electricity supply, and we want to ensure that we are reducing our CO2 emissions, and that's what ties into a national determined contribution or sustainability, um, the 2035 goals that we have and the 2030 goals, right? Um, in essence, your sustainable electricity means that you have sustainable development. So if we have an electricity supply that is affordable, secure, sustainable, we know for sure that in the long term, Grenada and Grenadians would benefit a lot because we're going to have a lot of sustainable development taking pl place. Now, I would just flesh out here a little bit quickly um, some of the, the actual regulations that we're seeking to to get implemented in the first go at this, right? So the, the ones that I highlighted in blue were the draft regulation on rules and procedures for applying for license and permit, and the draft regulation on tariff setting methodology. These documents are at the phase now that we're, we are engaging in the working group session. So we would have done similar sessions like this, the public hearing, in which we have garnered the, the comments of key stakeholders and the public, make sure that they have access to making their points and the comments, and then we would have moved over into these working group session. And the working group session is more, uh, a, a more of a very in comprehensive discussion in which we're fleshing out some of the key ideas or the key sticking points, right? And I can say that we have had one of those sessions already on the tariff setting methodology, which was very well um, uh, received. Um, we didn't get as much persons as we expected because we invited a few persons, but I think it was a very fruitful exercise. We have a follow-on on this on the, um, coming up pretty soon on the 19th. Um, the document that we're looking at today is the one highlighted in red, the Draft Generation Expansion Planning and Competitive Procurement Regulation. The other documents, um, the draft license for Grenlec in terms of the generation aspect and the network aspect, and then looking at the technical regulations, which is the grid codes, um, these documents will follow pretty swiftly from here because we, if you saw a schedule, you see that within the next two months, we would have gone through all of these documents through all of these phases that I mentioned, public hearing and the working group sessions to us to get them to the place where we can use them as our instruments. Now, in instituting rules and procedures, there are two key things I'm going to highlight here. The obligation to serve the ratepayers as the consumers with competition and lower prices, and also an establishing an enabling environment for the renewable investments. So these are two key aspects, and we're going to elaborate on this a little bit further as you listen to the presentation coming on later. But basically, we want to ensure that there is enough competition, and I mentioned it before, competition for the market, so that we can attract a lower price coming in, okay? so that the rate payers would be, have a beneficial aspect in terms of the price that they pay for electricity would be um, in a very competitive and a very good, good place. Establishing an environment for renewable investment. And this is this regulation that we're looking at here. That's one of the regulations that we have to do this. We have the generation expansion, competitive procurement for independent power producers. And as we dive into this presentation a little bit later, by our director engineer, Mr. Bola, you would have an, an appreciation for some of the key tasks that they highlighted here. I just want to say that all of these, the competitive procurement regulation, <coughs> excuse me, is, has an overarching <laughs> direction, right? And this is a long term expansion planning. So there's something called an IRP, you have um, IRRP, which is integrated resource and residency planning. You have IRP, integrated resource planning. You have least cost expansion. You have a lot of different expansion studies that can be used. Um, Long-term expansion planning is what is key in guiding how much generation you need at what point in time as you, as you follow that temporal timeline as you go along into the future, right? Um, and the presentation that's coming up is going to dive into how we tend to address or 
provide that enabling environment. Now, I'm just highlighting something here because I want to draw your attention to one final aspect up to the upcoming presentation. Now, what is proposed, and I mentioned that we've had a working group session with the tariff methodology. What is proposed for the tariff going forward because the PRC is, is mandated to set, review, and ensure that we have the right rates, the tariffs, right? There is your non-fuel cost, right? There is a fixed charge, there is a demand charge, there is a fuel charge, and there's something called a renewable energy charge. And that's the one that I wanted to point out here, and I have it um, somewhat en enveloped in, in, a bra in a rectangle there. Um, so basically, the renewable, the renewable charge is meant to reflect the cost of renewables to the customers. So the network licensee, which will be the main utility, is going to procure or to buy renewables from IPPs and self-generators. Now, that price needs to be translated for what the rate payers pay. And if you're to compare that with the fuel cost, you should be able to, at some point in time, move to a trajectory where in which you're gonna have a sustainable or lower cost base for, your, for, for the price of electricity. Because assuming that you focus on fuel and the fuel goes up and down, right now um, I was listening to the news yesterday or so and I saw that the cost of um, fuel has gone back to just before COVID. I'm not sure if any of you would have seen this, but we expect that to continue going up because now they're getting an opportunity for having greater um, development and whatever. People going back to normal, you're gonna expect the, the, the supply and demand to give you that sort of a higher price. So the fuel charge in itself replace, reflects the energy cost for the electricity, right? So you burn fuel and you need to pay for that fuel. So as an analogy, instead of paying for fuel, you're not gonna be buying or you're gonna be buying renewable energy produced from solar panels, et cetera. What you expect is that in the long term, that cost should dwarf the cost of fuel. So essentially we can be moving in the space of nine cents US, 18 cents EC per kilowatt hour instead of paying 41 cents. Um, we, move, we can move in a space around those cents. We can have, right now we have um, 36 cents um, EC per kilowatt hour. Um, and then there is the other aspect which I'll mention on the next slide. But basically, I just wanted to present to you here some of the key aspects that sets the stage for the tariff methodology where we're saying um, the renewable charge and the discussion we're having here today is where this whole aspect lies. Okay, so IPP versus self-generation. And there, there is just two things I want to highlight, well, actually, but two main things I want to highlight here. Um, there are existing self-generators in Grenada, right? Um, we have no IPP, and I can put that in inverted commas because we have no IPP type set up for any, in any installation, in current solar installation in Grenada right now. A lot of them are self-generators. Some of them are 100 kilowatts, 100 plus. Um, no one is way past the 200 or the 300 kilowatts. We don't have any one megawatt size systems, which is referred to as utility scale installations, right? Um, so in terms of self-generation, the whole narrative, um, that the existing narrative have to change about what is really a self-generator and what is really an IPP. And I just wanted to set this stage here and keep that for our conversation later um, because um, there are many persons who think that they're in the realms of the self-generation. I can say that self-generators are persons who are gonna generate electricity for their own use and any excess, then they sell back to the utility. And IPP is someone who is investing, and that's why I say the enabling environment for investing in the sector is, is, is being, being targeted now. Um, changing the existing narrative is key. With self-generator, we have this net meter, net billing sort of a narrative that is existing. So we have net billing and the self-generation speaks as part of the legislation, speaks to net metering, right? We can, we will discuss all of this at a later time, but I just wanted to set the stage here. Um, this has led to a lot of oversized installations um, in terms of people, because of the net billing, instead of investing in a little one or two kilowatt system because you want to be a self-generator, now you have to install, you have to invest in a 10, 
15, 20 kilowatt system because of the return on investment and trying to get back to parity to where you need it to be because of the whole pricing mechanism that exists, which I wouldn't just know. Um, so differentiating the self-generation and IPPs is key. And as we go into the, the other aspects about the competitive generation expansion and procurement, we're gonna have a good understanding of where an IPP basically lies, right? Okay, so I'm gonna stop off right here. Um, and I hopefully we can get our technology to allow us to have the um, follow-on presentation. Yes, we know. So I got a indication that it's not yet feasible to receive. Um, okay. Thank you, Dr. Matthew. Ladies and gentlemen, just a gentle reminder that we are going live on GIS, the Government Information Services Facebook page and YouTube channel. We are also streaming live on Mikey Live. So for persons who are joining us virtually, please, if you leave a comment, leave also an email address so that we can contact you. If you have a question, a concern, we are eagerly anticipating your participation in this process. Now, I would like to call our engineer, Davril Bola, who is also an expert on renewable energy, to give a presentation. Mr. Bola. Thank you, Ms. Philip. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Grenadians, and we're streaming live, so in theory, we're reaching the whole world. So whoever is following us, wherever you are, good evening. I would like to present on uh, generation expansion planning and competitive procurement regulations. And just to get us into what we're going to look at, I'd like to make special mention because everything we do regarding policy falls back on our Electricity Act. So our Electricity Act, referring to our Energy Supply Act, number 19 of 2016, and amended in 2017, Act number 33. Uh, we would speak specifically about section 14, 16, 17, and focus on, well, these three speak about licenses, and section 37, which is what we will get really in depth with, with our generation expansion planning So, here we go. Section 37.7, expansion studies. Now, expansion studies are divided into these six areas. And as I just mentioned, everything falls back to our Energy Act. And it's part of the bigger picture when it comes to our initiation to a low carbon energy sector highlighted in our in the same act. It collaborates with our pledge for the Paris Agreement. It also is part of our national energy policy, the NEP.
National Determination Contribution on our Sustainable Energy Action Plan. They all coincide on the same things which go back to our, our legislation. Now I'll just like to share Excuse me a bit. Okay, so as I was mentioning, right here, can you see this? Okay, fine. Yeah, so. Everything coincides. And if we were to just permit me to read verbatim. So here we're speaking about aligning with our national energy sector policy. And if you will notice, if, if, you, if you would notice, sorry, we had targets for 2020. And we expected to be at 20%. Actually, we were at 4.2%. Now, Grenada is usually the front runner in the Caribbean. Today, we're behind Barbados, we're behind Jamaica, we're behind St. Lucia. Just allow me to read this for you verbatim. So Grenada has substantial renewable energy potential, notably geothermal, wind, including offshore, and solar resources. The potential renewable energy capacity is estimated at 120.5 megawatts, including 50 megawatts of geothermal, 50 megawatts of solar, 20 megawatts of wind energy, and 0.5 megawatts of hydro. Therefore, the power sector has the potential to diversify its generation mix through investment and scale up on renewables and reduce the dependence on imported fossil fuels and lower electricity costs. Now, I know there is a universal, or oh, sorry, a unidimensional dimension, thinking when we refer to Grenada and renewables, where a lot of people are eager to jump to solar. But as we can see here, our sun-kissed land of smiles is not just solar. There's a lot of opportunity for other means of renewables. Regarding the development of those generation projects which would allow us to take advantage of our resources. Here we have four steps which they cover effectively a preparation and submission of sustainability expansion plans. They allow us to identify generation projects. They allow us to prepare and approve business cases, procure those possible projects, showing all the requirements and the documents required, evaluate and award tenders for those projects, and to manage those contracts. So these are the four steps that an IPP would go through to be able to develop a project here in Grenada. So now we get into a bit more technical and feisty stuff. Two questions which the network licensee would be asking and a potential IPP would also have to ask themselves. Can I ensure and maintain sufficient generation capacity? And 
Can I allow the network licensee to permanently meet current and new projected electricity demand with a sufficient reserve margin? Now, there is this very dynamic process where projects would need to be identified, which goes back to our expansion studies, which would be carried out by the network licensee. Upon identification of projects that fit into the requirements, whether it's the, access, the assessment of demand growth, whether it's to meet demand or to replace existing energy supply, but that's based on, on fossil fuels, these projects would be identified and then screened and analyzed for their viability. They would be prioritized based on what they are offering and what is required at the time. And there will be an extensive fact-finding mission which would explore future energy scenarios. So this fact-finding mission would allow different scenarios to be portrayed and the best decision taken based on the needs of the country at any particular time. These, of course, would coincide with our expansion strategy and our national energy policy and be in the best national interest. Okay, so here we're speaking about fact-finding. There would be a gap analysis which would be performed to identify, so the gap analysis is effectively where are you, what you need, what do you need to get there. Then we would have to consider what is needed in the medium and long term based on expected demand and development. Do we have to develop electricity infrastructure? And of course, we always go are going to come back to the expansion plans included in the policy decisions such as a national energy policy or the national energy strategy. And we of course need to take into consideration projects considered as of national interest because they improve energy independence of the country and reduce the cost of electricity or improve reliability of the energy sector. Some of those technical aspects which would also have to be considered Just give me a minute, please. So for instance, when the fact-finding mission is taking place, besides the actual fit for that project within the energy policy, we have to look at technical specifications. We need to look at stuff, for example, the load forecast of peak power, annual energy de demand. Does that project fit into that portfolio? The reserves and reliability of whatever project is being proposed. The environmental cost and constraints. What are the economic, environmental, 
and environmental impacts on our country. What uncertainties does it uh, provide? And the end result, our aim is to develop a comprehensive fact base of renewable and conventional electricity generation options, including the cost, the cost trajectories, and the risk. We need to summarize alternatives with high potential in terms of energy efficiency. We need to analyze and identify all the technical aspects related to the generation projects which have been identified in accordance with the regulation. So effectively, we're looking at projects. We're analyzing each scenario. We're analyzing what they propose financially, economically, and the technical aspects to make a decision whether these projects fit what we need at a given time. After this is done, there is a determination, okay, we need this or that in a particular area. We have a deficit of whatever amount of energy based on uh, generation in the, in the country or projected generation. We would need a certain amount of energy within a, a particular time frame. Then we go to the generation of the business case, which is in fact the initiation of the process for the RFP, the request for proposals. So we have now decided that we do have a need, so we're going to ask interested parties to participate. In the business case, Yeah, it seems to have a mind of its own, <laughs> it's fine. So here we have a situation where we have identified a need and we're asking for interested parties to prepare a business case and to participate in a competitive procurement. So. The steps are as follows. We prepare the business case. There will be a determination of project viability. Then there is a structuring of the project and an evaluation of the proposed project against project criteria, which would be obviously 
the needs previously identified. Okay, so how do you determine project viability? Nobody? Money. You want to make money. So you determine project viability, and then there is a structuring of the project. Just permit me to delve into the legislation again. So, how do you structure a project? After having determined that a specific generation project is viable, the commission or the network licensee, whoever is responsible for the development of the business case, shall comply with the task specified in the regulation and shall structure the project through specifying the outputs allocating functions, allocating risk, and developing and indicating legal and financial structure. And the outputs shall be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely, and shall clearly be determined in measurable terms and shall, among others, include Details related to the basis of payment, penalties and incentives, and specific provision to be included in contracts or agreements related to the procurement of the project. So we have a business case being presented, which is now going to be analyzed against project criteria as long as it can be shown to be viable, and as long as it's well structured. And reference can be made to section 13, 14, 15, and 16 of the Energy Act. Now, after the business case is presented, we come to the phase of adjudication transaction and procurement. All the business cases are analyzed against the requirements that were previously specified and the bid, the successful bid would be identified and announced. During that phase, the commission, the PURC, shall act as the procuring entity, and the procuring entity shall be responsible for managing the transaction and the preparing and completion of the procurement process, and comply with the task indicated in this part. The part referred to is the following. The preparation for the transaction, preparing the draft in collaboration with the network licensee and the potential generation licensee, the PPA, the power purchase agreement, the generation license, and any procurement contracts and other agreements that will be finalized at that point in time. So the bidders are qualified, and then you have a preparation of RFPs and a management phase where you get the final signatures, you get the commercial and financial close, and any clarification meetings or any details which needs to be ironed out will be ironed out in this phase. Just permit me to go back again to the regulation. 
here the power purchase agreement i'll just i'll just share my my screen So I know a lot of people who were asking previously had a lot of interest in the power purchase agreement. So the power purchase agreement shall at least specify the rights and obligations of the network licensee, the authorities of Grenada, including the commission and the minister. It shall specify the output outlined in the business case, the performance of a standard, and any arrangements to monitor and to enforce the payments due, the changes, and any provisions relating to termination of the contract. Technology wins again, it seems. Okay. After the PPA is deliberated and, and, and signed, the phase of contract management lies with the PORC. And the four responsibilities would be to define the roles and responsibilities, establish, to monitor, and to manage. Now there is a procedure for this contract management protocol. There would be the formation of an operating committee, effectively a contract management team, who will communicate, would determine communication protocols the contract management matrix, which would be a format that would be elaborated in, in documentation, risk management plan, and fiscal risk monitoring if applicable. Now this would be structured in such a way where each party in the PPA would be allowed a representative and the equal number of representatives would be provided by the PORC. Then a, a commissioner to this uh, committee would be elected and they will meet as regularly as necessary but not less than once every six months to ensure that the project is going according to plan as stipulated in the contract. All of this can be summarized in this last slide. We have expansion studies which would be carried out. You have questions related to what do I need, what does the country need, and what do I need to achieve those goals? Within the gap analysis, where am I? Where do I want to get? What do I need to do to get there? We have the procurement or the presentation of business cases based on open and active tenders. We have the procurement of those tenders, which would be effectively the transactions being done to determine who is the best fit or which project is the best fit for what I need or what the country needs at that particular time. What do I want to achieve in the long term? And of course, there would be sustainability plans updated 
yearly and every five years, which would effectively reflect what is required in those expansion studies. I just want to close by saying that being an IPP is serious business. This isn't, the generation license has a duration of 25 years at least. And this, this procedure might seem complex, but it's necessary as a filter to ensure that those who get involved can go the long term. This isn't a, a cell phone contract where you can start and then two, three months later you can buy out your contract. So that's the basis for the complexity of the generation expansion planning and procurement process. I'd like to thank you all for your attention and I'm open to questions. Ladies and gentlemen, again, a gentle reminder that we are going live on the Government Information Services Facebook page and YouTube channel. So members of the public, you are encouraged if you have any questions, concerns, anything you would like to ask that is pertinent to what we are talking about today, we are willing to engage you. Also, um, the floor is now open to persons who are here physically. If you have any questions, I would like to invite you to the podium you can come, state your name and portfolio or who you are representing and pose your question, please. Again, all comments, concerns, questions are relevant and we are eagerly anticipating those questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Clive Holston with, with Greenwich. Yeah. <laughs> um, looking at the process is very interesting. I mean, you, you outlined four, four different steps. Okay, but regarding the first step, it, it appears that whenever it comes to the generation expansion plan, it's a matter of going through the identification phase. Okay, where we do a number of things. We look at projections, um, fact finding, screening, and all of that in order to, 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 to identify various projects and then go to the next stage, which is a business case. Th throughout the presentation, th 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 there wasn't any mention of an IRP. In the introduction, there was, okay, but it didn't come into, into perspective at all during the entire presentation. So a suggestion, I mean, an IRP is a very, very critical document for any, any country regarding future generation and, and what type of generation and when that generation should come in. Okay, so our suggestion is that this whole process, there should be greater emphasis on the production of an IRP document, integrated resource plan, okay, which basically takes input from all relevant stakeholders. And with that, we look at expansion, we look at a different type of a technology and Grenada determines what type of generation we need when. We could say, and we'd have to do all the studies, all the consultation, all the work that goes into it, and say that 2022, we need five megawatts of solar. 2023, we need two megawatts of wind. 2030, we need 10 megawatts of, 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 of geothermal. Okay, but it's outlined step by step. So when it comes to the need for generation, we already know or we already have an idea of what it is we want and when we want it. And then it's a matter of going into the business case, doing all the feasibility and, and, and taking it from there, right? So, you know, just proposing that there should be a greater emphasis on an IRP and the sooner we could do this and, 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 and kick the process off, 
okay, I think it will be better, it will be clearer, there will be greater transparency, because everybody would have their input into it, so that we could, we could get the rest of it flowing fairly quickly. Um, thank you, Mr. Hussein, for your um, comment, question, comment. Um, I was just trying to sort um, some of the technical issue there. Um, indeed, um, your, your comment is, is, is greatly appreciated in, in that respect. The regulation itself, the Generation Expansion Regulation, um, Competitive Procurement Regulation, um, has that strong element that there is a need for an integrated resource planning um, aspect. And you would see in Annex 7 of the document that there is a request for the integrated resource planning, which um, is requested of the network licensee. Um, and that network licensee is um, under that request mandated to perform the integrated resource planning. But the expectation is not the network licensee um, who would, and for explanatory uh, purposes, network licensee would be the aspect of the, the, the electricity system or that entity that is responsible for the transmission, distribution, and the supply of electricity in Grenada, right? Then we have something called a generation licensee, which um, in that respect, the utility, the main utility now would have the generation license for providing generated electricity. Right? So the network licensee is mandated to prepare the IRP, but not on their own accord, as you mentioned rightly, that there needs to be um, that whole stakeholder engagement. So every person and every entity should have the opportunity to contribute to what the integrated resource planning would look like, because we are looking at where the country is heading in terms of the GDP. We're looking at what sort of mechanism are in place, um, anything to do with energy efficiency, electric vehicles, a shift to electrification of the transport sector. All of these are a lot of critical aspects where it's not just about the network licensee alone that we know that, or the PRC with our internal capacity, but we need the full-fledged um, onboarding of all key stakeholders. So Annex 5 of the document and I, um, has the requirements for the IRP. But also, I, I agree that we need to put that at the forefront because that lays the pathway for where exactly we're heading. Thank you. Any other questions? You can just come to the podium and... Good evening to everybody. My name is David Phillip. I am a renewable energy enthusiast. Um, I have been following the process for a while and a number of questions um, comes to mind. I happen to know that some studies were done. We have had reports in Grenada 2011, 2017. Um, energy dossier, energy policy. And I'm, I'm sitting listening to um, the gentleman and it, it, it appears to me as though we are almost starting from scratch um, because we, we, we are trying to gather information to go to a particular direction. I think um, Dr. George mentioned that we are 16% behind what we targeted in 2020 we are supposed to be 20, we should have been 20%. We are four, so we are 16% behind. And we're in 2021. Those 
requirements that were laid out here? Are there timelines attached? When do we expect to see us transition into renewables if all of those things that we're supposed to be doing is not yet being done? Um, um, the previous speaker mentioned about the IRP. It's IRP. Um, and it seems to me that that is, that is something that is desperately needed. So how can we plan if those basic things that we need to do is not yet done? I am told that we have, we are creeping along as far as renewables are concerned. So if we, we, we back 16% in 2021, and all of those things have to be done, where do, we, where do we see ourselves by the end of 2021? Do we have targets? Um, Dr. Jordan, we spoke today briefly, and my question was, with the new drive with regard to renewables, where are we looking to um, determine who is self-generators and who is, um, you know, the, the one megawatt people and the whatever. Sometimes it's best to, as my deceased mother used to say, creep before you walk. And, and I, I'm wondering if we're not biting too big because not too long ago, self-generators, and I, I, I checked the definition in the act, a self-generator can, based on how I interpret the act, can be somebody who produces 500 um, kilowatts. Doesn't have to be five or 10 kilowatts because the definition allows for that particular person or individual to produce excess, not just for his consumption. So I'm wondering if, if our approach should not be one where we creep. While we, we, we prepare for the, the long haulers, the one megawatts and the five megawatts, the same process we use to get to 4%. I think we should, we should creep there and, and try to get those things going because you can, you can target the big numbers, but while you're working towards the big numbers, you are slowly building your, your renewable capacity. And I am hoping that that is something that will adopt. Let us slowly get where we want to get. Because if we have to wait for all those things to happen, we probably would be speaking in 2025, we have another target we have to reach. Um, I don't know how soon, how soon we'll get there. So, so my thoughts are that, yes, the overall, the big picture is that we need to follow what is recommended by the experts. But because we're so far behind at this stage, I think we can do things parallel. We don't have to wait until the, um, the studies are done or you know, the invitation. Even the, on the bid question, um, when somebody wants to invest, and I'm speaking both as an enthusiast and someone who have information as to potential investors. In fact, there was a meeting not too long ago and a question was asked, how soon can an investor get himself involved in, in Grenada? If somebody has the cash to invest in solar, how soon can he get engaged? And based on what I'm hearing today, it would be a little while. Because we're not creeping. We're trying to walk. So, um, Dr. George, you know me, I'm, I'm, I'm generally a blunt speaker. I think we need to look at this thing from the standpoint where we can make baby steps, and I'm speaking as a small man, we can make baby steps so we get to another 4% probably in the next year or so by doing the 100 megawatts, the 75 megawatts, the 50, uh, sorry, kilowatts, sorry, not megawatts. The 100 kilowatts, the 50 kilowatts, the 75 kilowatts. Let those Grenadians who want to get involved in the solar revolution. Don't bog them down with all of those RFPs and this other sort of stuff. It's one more thing before I go, and I probably want to ask um, Mr. Hosten is here. If an individual 
comes forward tomorrow and says, I want to do a five megawatt plant. Can the existing infrastructure support that project? If somebody walks in and says, look, I have $50 million and I want to invest, I want to do five megawatts. Can the existing infrastructure support that or do we have to invest in upgrading? So Dr. George, I hope I'm not, I've not, I'm not been controversial, but I'm just saying before I take my seat that I think we should look at this thing from the standpoint where we can do little things as we progress to where we really want to be. Thank you. To answer your question, one of the main things, okay, when it comes to electricity grid, okay, besides sustainability and cost, okay, is that of security and stability of the system, yeah. So that's that's a critical nature, yeah. There's there's so, there's some more codes that we're going to be looking at in terms of the grid code. Okay, for, 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 for supply, transmission generation, okay, and that, that, that sets out a lot of the technical criteria. So to so answer your question directly, we would have to perform a system impact study, okay, where we take our computer model, okay, of the grid, okay, and inject this five megawatt at the location. Location is key, okay, location is key. I could tell you right now that there's some areas that we would not be able to accommodate it as it is right now without adding additional infrastructure, okay? And there's some way it probably can, okay? But, 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 but the thing is that we would have to perform some technical studies, right? Depending on the location, okay? The type of inverter, okay? There's some nice things called anti-islanding, okay? Where you don't want this basically to, if you have a poor outage, that this thing could feed back onto the grid. You don't want a case where you get reverse power flow, okay, where the load on this feeder is so light that this actually feeds back into the plant when the system is, is designed for the power to flow the other way and can create all type of problems with our protection devices, okay? So we definitely have to do a lot of studies for that. So I, I would like to add to this. Um, based on the questions that you asked, right, or the comments or the points that you highlighted, and I would just piggyback from what Mr. Houston just said. Now, there is a lot of um, integral studies and different understanding that needs to be had before you can have this large-scale sort of integration. And the point that you made of, I mean, creeping, so having the small scale persons coming on, etc. cetera. Um, this is on the strong consideration of how things can evolve. One point I want to make about what, make about what Mr. Houston said is that the tariff methodology or the regulatory framework that we have now provides the avenue for making sure that the cost that is associated with those studies or the cost that's associated with those upgrades can be properly considered, right? And what I'm saying here is that within the tariff methodology, there is something called the regulatory asset base of the utility. There are things called the cost of capital. This speaks to how much and where investments can go in. So you have your capital investments. And over time, you can say, well, we can stepwise the investment in the sector over time based on the price that people can afford to pay, right? So we can have a stepwise sort of orientation. So the, the document that we're speaking about now is not or should not be held in silo to the other documents that is being considered for the regulatory framework. So the tariff methodology gives that broad scope or the avenues for what we can do with the, with, with the generation expansion. So the generation expansion, the IRP, which is mentioned a lot, and the critical aspects about it, now that document itself 
it gives you how much and when and what can be done. The tariff can tell you well, where the costs can come from, all right? Um, how much consumers can actually pay. You have cost of service, you have load studies, you have a lot of different studies. So it's a whole in integral, compact um, sort of thing that is going on here. It's not, nothing should be seen and should be held in total silo. Um, to address what you mentioned, Mr. Philip, in terms of the, the IRP and what we're doing here might seem not to be totally reflective of everything that is necessary. Um, this regulation or this regulatory instrument, what it would do is that it, as is laid out in Annex, F Annex 7, it gives the authorization for the PRC to now demand of the network licensee to do the IRP. So as soon as this regulation is promulgated, and I would say that we would have at least um, interacted with the network licensee or with, with, with the utility and, and already mentioned to them, they were seeing this in this document, that the process of getting to work, engaging for the IRP, the procurement process for getting the right IRP and how we're gonna do this, um, that should be a, a process that's already started. So one of the main things, and if you can take away one thing good from this document being finalized, putting aside all of the um, difficult or the complexity that you think you would have seen before, um, is that as soon as this document is promulgated, and that's where we're pushing ahead with this, this would now give us the legal footing to say that we can now request the IRP of the network licensee, um, because that's what's laid out in the legislation and the regulations. Um, any more questions? Um, you can come ahead. Sorry, like I mentioned before, we are all about inclusion. And we do have persons joining us virtually and they have sent in some questions. After which we'll take some more questions from persons in the room. We have a question from a Mr. Eric, and it goes, are energy requirements projections available? Just to repeat, are energy requirements projections available? Um, my interpretation um, would be within the, the scope of the question. Um, I think we, we head him back in the space of the, the IRP and, and what is required for an IRP study, basically. So in terms of your load forecasting, um, you want to get a result in generation mix. And what is laid out in legislation is that our generation mix should be heavily dominated by sustainable options or more energy efficient options, so renewables, um, and we can harness our renewable resources in Grenada. Lots of solar, um, we should have a lot of wind resources, we have a lot of geothermal, so we have potential resources where we can harness all of these resources. So essentially, um, the requirements I think would be heading in that sort of orientation in terms of where our generation mix is gonna evolve into, or what should be your evolving generation mix. Was there any other questions? Hello, I'm Charlie from Blue Dawn Solar. I have a question, just a quick one. Um, is an IPP allowed to sell energy directly to the consumer for a localized installation? Yeah, so if we have a, take a hotel for example, that would like to invest in solar energy, but as a company we could front the upfront uh, capital for the project in return for a commitment that they buy energy directly from an IPP um, for a fixed term would be the question. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, as laid out in the legislation, uh, the only entities we, um, that can sell electricity to the consumer or any consumer would be the network licensee. 
So the network license is transmission distribution supply, right? If you have a totally off-grid system <coughs> in which you do the investment or whatever, and then that person is your self-generator or the entity that can now generate their own, ele own electricity and supply themselves, then I guess within that space you can supply that individual there, but you would not be paid as a, it would not be a legal um, within the legislation that you're a supplier of electricity. It's as if you're being an ESCO, an energy service um, entity, which you're doing an ESCO. Um, the legislation itself, um, it's not very, very clear, I should say, on exactly how we can facilitate the ESCOs, but it's very clear that any selling of electricity to any consumer should be done by the network licensee. So the network licensee would buy the electricity from the independent power producers or the self-generators, and they would transmit that electricity to where the load is or wherever the consumption area is, and then they, that consumers would now buy the electricity from there. Um, yeah, was, did that address your? Yeah, energy Energy, ESCO you're referring to, right. Again, we have questions from our virtual audience. From Mr. Eric again. Will concessions be available for importing equipment? And I suppose that would be renewable energy equipment. One. And there is another from Mr. Paul Antoine. It's a bit lengthy. We are behind our targets with penetration of renewables. There are, however, self-generators waiting to connect under the old Grand Lake terms. Why not let them connect now under those terms? Okay. So I'll address the first question in terms of the concession. Now the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, as the regulatory body, is not the responsible body for concession, right? Um, concession is via the government of Grenada and the entities that, um, that are related to so Ministry of Finance, etc. But I would say that we are in support of that sort of a stimulation of, for the sector. I mean, in terms of how do you get persons to have that buy-in? And I think that uh, maybe someone in the room can can speak to this also, that there are some mechanisms in place already that will allow you to have a reduced cost on your importation of any renewable um, panels, uh, solar panels, inverters, etc. anything associated with renewable generation. I see some nodding of heads. Um, when it comes to this, this second question, as a, as a more substantial um, uh, comment here. I would say that there are some things that are legal and there are some things that are not legal, right? The Electricity Act came into being in 2016 um, and there was an amendment in 2017. Now it repealed what happened under the 1994 legislation, right? Um, so everything that occurred before that in which you had a, a, um, the utility or Grand Lake has been the body that says we can supply you or we can allow you to self-generate. Now what the new legislation actually have done is that it has provided a third party environment in which you have a regulatory body who is mandated to ensure that there is fairness and then there is enough proper um, rules and directives in place that would help for ensuring that everyone can have a part to play in all of this, right? In terms of being self-generators. Um, there one, there's one thing that was addressed, and I mentioned it on my slide earlier, the net billing versus the net metering. Now, what, what the utility currently does, or what they have been seek to do for the last four and a half years, right, from 2016 to now, was to install you as net build. And I can give a simple analogy on this, right? And I've used it a previous, um, pretty much often before. So imagine that we have a village bakery and the village bakery 
is the one that supplies your village with bread. And then you have, let's say, four or five different families in, in the village, and they have their own little oven at home, and it costs them a certain value to make a bread, right? Maybe they can buy the flour or whatever, and they make their own bread. So they invest and they, bought and they make their own bread. Now, what the net billing does is that it tells you that if you want to eat the bread that you made, you need to sell it to the village bakery for a price, let's say $1, and then you need to buy it back from the village bakery for $2. So because the village bakery now needs to cover its costs, right? Now what the new legislation is saying is that if you make your bread at your home, then you eat your bread, and if you want more bread, you can go to the village bakery and get bread for whatever cost they offer to you, right? And if we were to continue doing what was being done before, then we we'll still have everyone as a disadvantage in which you have now the village bakery taking all your bread and sell it back for you at a higher price than you would have paid for it when you made it. Right? And that is one of the reasons why the PRC has sought to somewhat pause that orientation that is existing until we have the right orientation in place and we accept that there is, that pause might seem to um, ignite in your head that we are not pushing ahead, things are not taking place and nothing is going on. But we would have sought and we would have sought um, in October and even after that to um, make the necessary requirements to say, come to the PRC, apply to us, we know who is in the pipeline. If you are in the pipeline and you're thinking about investing, apply to the PRC. Just come into our office, call us 4371602, or just um, send an email to sgapplication at prc.gd. We know who you are, and then we can benchmark you or cross-reference you to what the utility would have told us of persons who would have been in the application process so far. And on a case-by-case -case basis, then we can address those, um, those installations. In the meantime, as we get those regulations sorted so that we can move to the place where we can have the, the right orientation, that is the, the intent of the legislation. And that would be the, the, the more precise answer to the question asked. We have, an, we have an online audience. Yes, um, I would say one of the issues I understand is that those self-generators, not self-generators, those small solar producers, there seems to be a challenge as to where they can be placed because it appears to me that the, the PROC is seen the IPPs as persons who do one megawatt and, and over, um, and the self-generators are those who, who should be generating electricity for, them, for themselves. But as I said, if you look at the definition, and I'm just saying that there's a walk around, if you look at the definition of self-generator, it gives the PERC the authority to consider those persons who do those 100, 150 kilowatts as self-generators. If you look at the, 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 the definition as, as laid out in, 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 the, in the act. So the comment that the person sent there is, is it's a burning issue and a number of people are, are saying that um, Grenadians who started getting interested in, in producing electricity to sell to Grand Lake um, have been stumped because according to the Jamaicans, all of a sudden, they can't do it anymore. There's a pause. In fact, I'm one of those persons, um, and I got a letter from Grenlick outlining the procedure with, you know, whenever you see however at the end of a, a letter, however, so I know what was coming next. So I'm really hoping, uh, the person who sent this, 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 this um, question in, I'm really hoping that a walk around can be found because I'm seeing we can use the very act and, con and put those persons under self-generation criteria and we would not be violating the law. Because if, if, if PROC is pitching one megawatt um, 
as, as persons who should be getting the IPP, as it were? That's the word? IPP? Yeah. Right, yeah. If that's, that's, your, that's, that, that's your, your criteria for considering IPP, I mean, I, I am on a certain financial institution's board, and we, we process loans. People come to us um, with requests for, for setting up farms, and it may seem as though what they, what they are being paid is unfair, but when they work the numbers out, they benefit. So I, I'm going back to what I said before I went to sit. We can make some baby steps because I think Grenadians have started to um, embrace the whole renewable energy concept and they would feel proud to know that they are contributing to the development of the renewable energy sector. So let's look at the definition again, Dr. George. Within that definition of, of self-generators, those persons can be accommodated. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you very much for the, the further inputs. And your comment is greatly acknowledged. And we have um, started deliberation within that space. Um, essentially, what the legislation laid out gave self-generators as someone matching your load or matching how much you use. So if on average I use five kilowatt hours a day, then you expect the install capacity should mirror this, right? So that you can now sell any excess, but you cover your, your costs. You basically, you're deferring your electricity bill. You're making your, your outlay for electricity much lower. Um, and then it kind of laid out what Mr. Bola went into into detail in which you have the utility scale, one megawatt and above, or, or you have the, those systems that are based on economies of scale will give you a better price. I remember I, I had on the slides the renewable charge. So if you have a better price of injection of, let's say, 9 cents US or, or 18 cents EC versus um, with a small system or whatever, you're getting 36 cents or, or something like that, then you probably shift these systems without the advantage, right? <clears throat> and we would have seen, and in deliberation and revising the regulations and look, looking at it, um, we would have seen that there is a gap within there. And Mr. Philip highlighted it. Um, and I kind of laid some of the slides out earlier just to um, lay the ground for this, right? Um, I didn't address it in, in, um, specifically before. But basically, there is a gap right there where what we can refer to as a small-scale IPP, where we can, and that is one of the things that we need to make sure is revised into the regulatory instrument, where we can look at these smaller size systems, the 100, the 200, the 500 kilowatts, um, in terms of a quantum, maybe a two or three megawatt size of that, where we can take them on a first come, first -come basis or based on the, your price that you can inject, um, combinational effects of that, and then you can have those um, small scale investors being accommodated, right? So we have and we will continue, if we have anyone who's interested in that, we welcome you to contact us also, the PRC, so we can look at you on a case by case basis. But we basically have dri driven, drawn up a matrix that speaks to the size of the system and also the time and, and looking at how we can best accommodate all space within um, that area. So basically you have the large size system, the utility scales, I, IPP type system, you have the self generator, and Mr. Philip mentioned something which is critical and important also, in which you can have a commercial entity which is a 200 kilowatt system, as per how the legislation is written, that can be a self generator. Um, but in that instance, there are other factors that we can, um, with the right pricing signals, we can make sure that that person is very sure that they want to be a self-generator. So in case that you want to come on, you can have a, a cost that you need to pay in order to come on um, as a, self, a full self-generator. Because if you look at the IRP and look at the long-term planning, we need to be sure that we know how much is the load or what is the appropriate generation that you need at specific times. So there are different economic things you can do, pricing signals, there are different things that you can do to make sure that these persons um, are self-generators in the, that pure respect and, and not necessarily um, 
being disadvantaged or disadvantaged in the system because we need to ensure that the utility who would have made investments also have the return on the investment that is, that is useful for what they need to do, right? That the business remains sustainable also. So we're not getting rid of the village bakery. We're just making sure that everyone have their fair, fair share of the, the pie or the cake or whatever you want to refer to it as. <laughs> More questions? Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to wrap up very soon. And if you can permit me this final question from Mr. Adam Smith. What is the PURC's desired timeline to begin the granting of new licenses and permits for self-generators and IPP? Now I can speak on behalf of the commission, right? Um, and the commission and the PRC, the Public Utility Regulatory Commission, is seeking and we want to ensure that this has been done since yesterday, right? Um, but realistically, we, we have a, a, a very rigid timeline in which we, we're pushing to make sure that we have um, the conversations on the regulatory instrument needed to get to the the place where we need to be, where in terms of the rules and procedures for applying for license and permit, that regulation should be in place so that we can have the appropriate procedures for the application for the license and the permits. Now that document should be finalized within the next um, couple of weeks in terms of having the working group session on it and then presenting that document to the ministry, so the minister, so that it can be considered and then gazetted. Once it's gazetted, then it's considered one of your legislative instruments for the guiding of the sector. That's as far as we need for this. Now, once that happens, then we know we're in a place for getting the self-generator program um, at least at that point. The competitive procurement regulation, um, this is also has that strict timeline in which we're trying to get to that place within the next couple of weeks also. Um, so I would say by before the middle part or the, the second quarter in this year, that is uh, where we're thinking that everything should be more or less in place. Self-generators before that. We think that within the next couple of weeks, the self-generators, we will be discussing the program in a couple um, weeks' time on the 23rd. Um, inside this very place here, we'll be having a working group session on this um, where the program will be presented to the key stakeholders and then we will now move to get that there was the application process in, in line with getting everything going. I would say here with a little hint of caution that we want to get to the end very fast, but we have to make sure that we don't trip over ourselves. Um, so everything has to be very um, calculated, I should say, uh, comprehensive, and we should take the appropriate time that is necessary to make sure that we don't come back within two days or within a week or two weeks to say, wow, we need to change this because this doesn't make much sense and then you have a longer process to change it. Um, but basically that is the guidance that as soon as possible and before the third quarter, so by the end of the second quarter I would say, we would have all the instruments in place and that's given us a fat timeline but we hope to get everything done before that. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we from the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission would like to thank you so much for your engagements with us today. We know time flies when we are having fun and therefore we have made accommodations to persons who would have comments or questions, queries, anything you want to ask us just to engage with us. Please send us an email at consultation at purc.gd. Again, consultation at purc.gd. Leave your comments, your questions, your concern, and since it's an email, don't be afraid to leave a telephone number as well. Myself or someone from the office will call you to let you know we've received that email. Your um, expressions are very important to us. Also, um, we have a few more spaces for our next consultation. You know, given the limitations um, of COVID-19, we can only facilitate a limited number of persons. So please, our virtual audience, 
you are welcome to join us. We are sufficiently spaced out, so um, there is a very low chance of you catching COVID here. So don't be afraid to um, join us. Our next consultation is on Wednesday, February 17th at the St. Andrews Methodist School in Grenville, St. Andrews. The time is 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. We will be discussing the draft Grenada Electricity Sector Grid Code Introduction Code and the draft Grenada Electricity Sector Grid Code Generation Code. The documents for these are available on our website, www.purc.gd. Take a read, have your concerns, your queries, your suggestions, your advice, and please reach out to us. Once again, thank you very much for this rewarding engagement. I am Sophia Philip, and on behalf of the PURC team, thanks for joining us. See you soon. Somebody say, hello, hello, hello. somebody say, somebody cry. Why, why?